we looked at the first few lines of the Pauri last week. And Guruji started by asking a very fundamental question about where is your door? How do I find you? What is it like at your house, at your mansion? So Guruji asks the most important question, which is, after all that's said and done, where do I go to find you? What is your house like? What would it be like to be in the presence of you? How would I know when I'm there? And so Guruji talks about all the great things in life that are singing your praises. Talks about fire and the air singing your praises. And Guruji carries on with this analogy. The next line that we look at is Gavahe Siddha Samadhi Andar Gavan Saad Vichare. Siddhs, the Siddhas, are singing Samadhi Andar in deep meditation. The Siddhs that are in deep meditation, they're also singing to you, they're also singing your praises. Gavan Saad Vichare. And Saad means the Sadhus. Notice the word Siddh and Saad. Both are missing the ankar. It's a mukta word which makes them plural. The siddhs in deep meditation and the sadhus, vichare, who are also contemplating about you. So an interesting thing about the spelling here is that you notice the words with a sihari here. So gavahe, andar and gavan. So in this one line we're seeing two different reasons why the Sihari is being placed on a word, according to the grammar rules of, of Gurbani. The first word, Gavahe, has a Sihari because a Sihari is used to talk about a verb, a word that is a describing, that's trying to describe an action, anything that is being done. So singing is an action. So where you're describing a verb like that, you have a sihari. So gavhe, and the same applies to the word gavan. So this is how you know when there are sometimes words in Guru Granth Sahib Ji that may have two different meanings. One of them could be a noun and another one could be a verb. It's the spelling that Guru Arjan Dev Ji has employed here throughout Guru Granth Sahib Ji to help us understand which version of that word is being used. And we also see the word andar that has a sihari. So another reason why we use a sihari on a word is to mean within. Within. So for example, you might see the word kar, house, home, spelt in three different ways. One with an onkar, meaning a single house. You might see kar without an onkar. That means homes. But you can also see the word kar with a sihari, which means within the home, inside your home. So the word under obviously means inside, which is why we see the sihari there. But whenever you see other words which don't sound like they are feminine words, because the word kar, for example, is a masculine word, so why would it have a sihari there? The only reason that a masculine word would have a sihari would be because we're talking about inside that thing inside the house. And in the same way the word kar isn't a verb, it isn't a doing word. So you know just by looking at the word and looking at how it's been spelt exactly what Guruji means. Gavahe Siddha Samadhi Andar Gavan Saat Vichare. So the word Siddh refers to a Siddha, someone who has reached the peak of enlightenment and obtained spiritual powers. So in Hindu mythology, there are spiritual powers that are gained through deep meditation. And these are called Siddh or Siddhi. So a Siddh is a person who has obtained Siddhis, who has obtained these spiritual powers. And we see this word come up 
in earlier parties of Japji Sahib, at the beginning of the Sonia parties, Guruji started by saying, Sonia Sid Pir Suranath. So it's talking again about these Sids, these people with spiritual powers. There are in fact 18 spiritual powers that have been identified within the spiritual tradition of Indic, ancient Hinduism, ancient Vedas and the Puranas have talked about these spiritual powers. The first eight of them are called Mahasiddhis, the great spiritual powers. And these include historically things that you would have seen and heard about in mythology like the Mahabharata, like Ramayana, where there are these great characters who are able to do special magical things. So the eight primary powers include being able to shrink in size into a size so small that you're as small as an ant atom and you're able to enter into any space. So that's one of the great powers. The other one is to grow in size, to gain a size in unlimited size, so in to increase your size voluntarily. Another spiritual power is to become light as air, to become weightless. So that's why you see certain characters within Hindu mythology that's able, uh, that are able to fly because they're able to make their bodies really light. Another one is to make your body very heavy so that nothing can lift you, nothing can move you. One is prapti, which is to fulfill all of your own desires. So any desire, any wish that comes into your mind, you can make that come true. Another one is to know the thoughts of someone else so you can actually read other people's minds. So the seventh one is supremacy, which is absolute lordship. Because you are so spiritually powerful, you become the lord of other people. You're able to control other people. And the final one within the eight spiritual powers is dominion over the elements. So you're able to control the sun, the moon, uh, nature, uh, water, the sky. You're able to control the elements. So these are the eight Mahasiddhs. So whenever Gurbani talks about Siddhs within Guru Granth Sahib Ji, they're talking about people who have obtained these spiritual powers. There's actually ten more powers which are about never feeling hungry, never feeling thirsty, being able to hear things from really far away, being able to see something that is miles away, to be able to travel at the speed of thought, so that what that would look like would be that for one moment, if I desire to be in another part of the world, at the instant speed of thought, I'm able to teleport to that part of the world. To enter the body of other people, Another Sid is to be able to choose the time and place and moment and way of your own death. So instantly you may decide that now is the time for me to die and you just allow yourself to die at that point. So that's another Sid. And then you can enjoy the company of God. So another one is at any time you may be able to go and sit amongst the lap of the gods. You may be able to get any wish come true and that you may be able to wander and walk in any way without any obstacle coming in front of you. So that could be things like walking through walls and walking through um, trees and, and mountains and things and absolutely just being able to walk in a straight line without any physical object being able to uh, hinder you in any way. So Guruji has talked about these things, about these spiritual powers, but interestingly in in meditative traditions, people would meditate to try and obtain these powers. And those are the people who have said that I'm going to meditate so deep for so long until I can get these spiritual powers. Now this thing is where our gurus have drawn the line and said, actually that's not something that we have to try and do. We should never try and meditate to obtain these powers. So we should never chase after these things because the, the, the very act of trying to achieve something like that is an act to increase your ego. Because then you walk around saying, I've obtained these or the only reason to do them is because you're still holding on to this notion of I. So Guru says that you should never try and actually chase after these. In fact, Guru Amar Das Ji, the third Guru says, Nav Niddi Atare Siddhi Piche Lagya Fire. They actually come and chase you. 
And who, who are the ones that these spiritual powers chase after? Guruji says, Jo har hirde sadavasai. Whoever has mantar, naam, wahiguru, the divine awareness within their hirda, within their core, whoever has put naam at the basis of who they are, then the 18 spiritual powers will start chasing after you. They will come after you. You don't need to run after them. So that's the use of the word Siddh there. And Saad refers to sadhus who are wandering meditators who walk around uh, and they don't have any particular home. They don't settle in one place. They're always wandering around. And because they're doing that, they don't have any way of earning their own food. So they rely on other people to serve them. So you may see them with a, a begging bowl, for example, which is where they expect people, when they go knocking on people's houses, they expect people to give them some food. So Guruji talks about the wandering sadhus who receive food from others. So Guruji is saying, Gavan sad vichare, those sadhus who don't focus on worldly things, they spend all of their time contemplating, they're doing vichar, so they don't have time to earn an honest living or, or earn food or, or earn money in any way. Another way to look at the word sad vichare, because they're wandering around, because they have no food for themselves, no means to earn for themselves, vichare here could also mean the garib, the poor, the humble sadhus who do not have any possessions for themselves. So you could say that sing the Siddhs in deep meditation and sing the humble sadhus rather than the meditative contemplating sadhus. And in the next line, Guruji says, Gavan jati sati santokhi gave veer karare. So the jati sati means, jati means those who are self-restrained, who have found self-control and whose meditative practice is all about restraining themselves and controlling themselves, controlling their passions, controlling their desires. Jati and Sati are the ones who are charitable. Wherever in Gurbani you see the word Sat and Santok together, the Sat there doesn't mean truth or doesn't mean Sat like in Satnam, it doesn't mean existence. There the word Sat always means charity, Sat Santok. So here we see Jati Sati Santokhi. So Jati is the one who is self-restrained. Sati are the people who are constantly giving. Their whole life is giving to charity. And Santokhi are the ones who are self-contented um, within themselves. So Gavana Jati Sati Santokhi. Sing the self-controlled, the charitable and the contented one. Gave Veer Karare. Veer here means warriors, the brave fighters, and karare means the really strong warriors, the really takare ones. So the great meditators and the warriors of mythology. So now Guruji is actually talking about all the Hindu mythology that you hear about, people and the main characters within them all fit within these characters, within these sort of categories. So as the list continues, we begin to realize that Guruji is, is actually saying that any great person in Hindu mythology that you may have heard of, all of those people are singing your praises. So we started the verse by talking about Ishar, Barma, Devi, the Shivas and the Brahmas and the goddesses. And now Guruji is further clarifying that all the Hindu mythological characters are ultimately all singing the praises at your door. So anyone who is seen worthy of being worshipped, Guru is saying, don't forget that these people are also worshipping that one final divine. Even f fire, water, the sky, Taram Raja, Shiva, Brahma, Indra, the <coughs> Devi, Devtas, the Sadhus, the warriors, anyone who you think is worthy of worship, Guru says, don't worship them because they're worshipping something higher. So they're worshipping this one divine. So Guru has always maintained this idea that anyone or anything that can be created or can be destroyed should never be worshipped because that's not permanent. What we're talking about is always the permanent truth, the ad such, jugad such. So we're always looking to find what is permanent in this situation. So rather than worship that which has been created, worship that creative power that has created them in the first place. 
the one that has the power to create everything and destroy everything. And so even all of these different types of meditators, even if their style of meditating isn't one of singing, Guruji puts them in the category of singers, says that whatever they're doing, ultimately their whole practice is a practice of trying to connect with the divine. So Guruji categorizes all of this as a type of singing. So here we can say that Guruji is basically saying that any meditative practice is ultimately a song to the divine. Their way of life, the way that they live, is a song to the divine, a praise to God. So Jati Sati Santoki, somebody who controls his mind, who keeps his body in control, someone who serves others. And the warriors can also mean the people who are fighting internal battles, the one who are fighting the ego and the one who are fighting the villains as well. Gavan Pandit Padan Rakhisar Jug Jug Veda Nale. So here Rakhisar is, is the main word. The Pandits, which are the, the priests within the Hindu tradition, the Hindu priests. Gavan Pandit Padan, the one who are constantly reading the scriptures. And Rikisar. Rikisar is, is a word that means Riki Ishar, which means the Rishis. Rishis is also another word for saints or sadhus. These divine Rishis. So sing the Hindu priests, the Rishi sages, who throughout the ages have read the Vedas. Jug Jug Vedanale, the ones who have constantly been contemplating and reading the message of the Vedas. So by them just simply living a life of focus on the Vedas, that style of life is also a type of meditation, is also ultimately a song to the Divine. Ultimately they're doing things to connect with the Divine. Gavehe Mornya Man Mohan Surga Mach Pyale So now Guruji has used feminine characteristics. Mohaniya means these beauties, these angelic divine angels, these beautiful divine tempting Man Mohan, the ones that are very enchanting to the mind. The word Mohan means something that enraptures your mind, something that enchants you. So Guruji talks about these divine beauties, these angels that are mind enchanting. Surga Mach Pyale. So Surga here means heavens, much the higher worlds, and Pyale means the Patals, the lower regions. Remember in Hindu mythology there are seven lower regions and seven higher regions. And that's where Guru Nanak Dev Ji talked about Patala Patal. Actually there are countless Patals. So Gave Mohunya Man Mohan Surga Mach Pyale. Sing the angelic beauties who enchant the mind in the heavens, the higher worlds and the lower worlds, the underworlds. So all of these angels are also singing your praises. Gavan Ratan Upaye Tere At Sat Tirat Nale So Ratan means jewels and again it's a plural word Gavan Ratan Upaye Tere So sing your created jewels and again in ancient mythology there are a very specific number of jewels and which jewels it is that are seen as the most precious whether they be actual rubies and diamonds or they're actually um, virtues and spiritual jewels but all of these within the spiritual context are singing your praises and atsat tirat nale so all material wealth which is your jewels your ratan and your tirat which is your spiritual wealth spiritual wealth is is in the old days seen as somebody who has gone and uh, visited all the spiritual places of pilgrimage they've gained a lot of spiritual wealth so guruji is talking about material wealth all of your money and your physical wealth and your spiritual wealth, ultimately they are a song to the Divine. And another way to look at Atsar Tirat Nale. Nale means who are beside or who are with the Tirats. And Tirats, the Atsar Tirat are generally places which have um, a meditation spot at the banks of a river or banks of a sacred pool. So the people who are Nale, who are sitting at those sacred places, all those people who go to those meditation places, who sit at the banks of those rivers and sacred lakes, they are also singing your praises because why do people meditate? 
ultimately everybody meditates to try and connect with this oneness. So all of these people in all of these different traditions are ultimately being a song to you. This is how Guru Nanak Dev Ji sees them. Guru is seeing them as a different way of singing your praises. Gavehe jod mahabal sura gavehe khani chare So the jod mahabal sura So these are different categories of warriors. The jodas, the mahabalis and the suras, the great types and categories of warriors. So the warriors, if we look at Hindu tradition and mythology such as the Mahabharata, we have the greatest warrior which was someone like Arjun. In the Ramayana, we have warriors like Ravan and Hanuman. So these great warriors fighting their battles, even they are singing your praises because they are doing Taram Yudh. They're doing battles for the sake of the divine, to protect the innocent. They're doing it to get rid of the world of, e- of evil. So they're doing a, their own way of spiritual practice, which is to fight. And Gave Kani Chare. So when we talk about the four Kani, what the word Kani means is the four types of creation. So again, Guruji is referencing old Vedic understanding of the world. And the Vedic understanding of the world says that all beings alive are created from one of four ways. Andaj, Jeraj, Setaj and Utpuj. Andaj means all beings that are born from under, from an egg. Setaj means all animals that are born from the womb. So we can say that Andaj animals, animals born from an egg are birds and reptiles. And animals born from the womb would be all mammals, humans, for example. Setaj means all living beings that come from the ground. So that could be all your plant life. And Utbuj means small beings that come from damp, warm, sweaty places like bacteria and germs. So they fall under this category of Utbuj, which comes from sweat. So animals that live in heat and damp, like your bacteria and your germs. So these are the four categories. So what Guruji is saying is that all beings from all four categories are singing your praises. Just by being alive, just the very fact that they exist is your praise, is your naam being sung. And when we look at these four different categories of life forms, it is said that there are 21 lakhs or 2.1 million life forms within each category. So four categories of 2.1 million life forms makes a total of 8.4 million lives or Chorasi Lak. So your Chorasi Lak beings all fit into one of four different categories as to how they are born. So the total of 8.4 million species are all singing your praises just by being alive. Gavhe Khand Mandal Varpanda Karkar Rakhe Tare so Khand Mandal Varpanda is now talking about land masses, land, regions, countries are singing your praises, universes are singing your praises. So Gavehe Khand Mandal Varpanda, Varpanda is Brahmand, which is these universes. All the universes just by being alive, just by existing are singing your praises. Kar Kar means that which has been created and is being created. Rakhe Tare, you are the one that has created all of these things and you are Rakhe Tare, you are looking after them. So we can translate this line as saying, sing the land masses, the regions, the universes that have been created and are looked after by you. So some translations refer to these as planets and stars and solar systems, which is the, the modern Western way of understanding the universe. But remember that this is written more than 500 years ago, so these words do not refer to the way we understand now. We can't say that these lines are talking about planets and stars and solar systems because that's just not the way that the universe was understood in those days. So the word kands do not mean planets, they mean land masses. Mandal doesn't mean stars, it means regions 
or we could say countries. And Varpanda again is a very specific way of looking at the universe, which is talking about the seven heavens and the seven earths and the seven uh, patals, the lower regions. So that would be one of the Varpand. It's not a universe the way we understand it. But the important thing is, as the universe was understood by the people of the time, Guru is saying that the entire universes are also singing your praises. So notice Guruji is very specifically using Hindu mythology here. Guruji could have used the word, your stars and your suns and your moons are singing your praises. But Guruji isn't talking about that. Guru is very specifically referencing Hindu mythology here. Guruji doesn't say the sun and the moon and the stars are singing your praises. Not that Guruji means that this isn't the case, but Guru is trying to get the people who are locked within this Hindu structure of seeing the world within uh, very specific things that should be worshipped. Guru is saying that all of these things that you're worshipping, they're all singing the praises of something higher. So don't ever forget that one. And sometimes we don't do Hinduism any justice by thinking that Hindus are only ever interested in the millions of gods and that the Hindus don't understand that there is this oneness. But that's not true. Even in the Vedas, they've always talked about this supreme oneness. So this concept of this oneness predates Sikhi and predates Islam. It's been there for thousands of years within the Hindu tradition. But it's only in the later grants in the Upanishads and the, and the um, Puranas and things like that where they really start trying to describe and categorize the world. And Guruji now takes all those categories and says, don't forget the truth that is in the Vedas. Don't forget those. So Guruji has tried to list a lot of different things here. But now Guruji is trying to come to the end of that list because he realizes that this list could just continue forever. So Guru says, Say tudno gavahe jo tud pavan rate tere pagat rasale. So they sing to you who you're pleased by. Say tudno gavahe jo tud pavan. Pavan means only those that are pleasing to you. Rate tere pagat rasale. Your worshippers are immersed and drenched in your nectar. The word rasale means rasvale. The ones who are drenched in, re, in ras, in that essence, in that nectar. So all that you have created, all are being sustained by you. Everything that is being created and sustained by you are all ultimately singing your praises. But Guru is saying that not every single thing that is out there is conscious to do that. There are only few of you that know there are only few of you that actually have that ability to sing your praises. So although everything that's been created is a type of song, the song of life, there's only few within that creation that you choose that are pleased to you, pleasing to you. Only they have the ability to really sing your praises. So what's Guruji trying to say here? Because Guru starts by saying everything is singing your praises. Now it says only those sing your praises who are pleasing to you and the ones that are merged within you. So not everyone is able to know the divine and not everyone is able to live that as part of their life, to make praise as part of their life. And there's no formula here that Guruji can give us that says these are the people that are going to be chosen in life to understand the divine, to know God. Guruji is not saying that. Guruji is not saying who can be living a life of praise, who can be a meditator in life and who can't be one. It says actually all of that comes down to divine grace. So look at the language that's being used all this time. Where is your mansion? Where is your house? All of these people are singing your praises. Guruji is painting a picture that an analogy that Guru has used time and time again, which is this idea that there is a king and who is sitting there, who is deciding, and all of these people and all of these different things are coming and singing your praises. Guruji talks about dar, your door, or it could also be your darbar, your royal court. So Guruji is talking about a king who just out of his own moj, out of his own kushi, his own happiness, the king is just deciding who he wants to bless. And so if you think about a king, king would do something quite randomly. 
and say, yes, I choose to bless you today. I choose to give you some offerings, some gifts today. The king has no one to answer to. King has no real reason to decide why he wants to do what he wants to do on a particular day. He doesn't have to explain himself to anyone. But Guruji has very specifically used some words here that affect the way we perceive this king. Now, Guru have, could quite easily have said that, O oh Lord, O oh God, you completely randomly decide who gets to meditate on you. Guru could have said that your choice is random. But if you think about the word like random, then think about how you're affected by that word. If we were working really hard to meditate on God, but we had this idea that God is just randomly choosing just out of his own desire who he wants to give it to and who he doesn't want to give it to what is the impact on your mind your mind feels disheartened your mind feels like oh i don't really i don't really get it why should i do any hard work why should i make any effort because no matter what effort i do it's just going to be random whether i get chosen or not it's like a lucky dip so guruji doesn't use words like that look at the words that guru is using guru says say tudno gave jo tud bhavan guru says that only those are being selected who are pleasing to you. So Guru is now implying this idea that you can do something to please this king. And now think about how that has an impact on your mind. You, use an analogy like a student trying to please a teacher by doing really good homework. There is an incentive there. Do you, do you see that there's, there's this way that somebody can think, actually, if my role is not to just do something and be randomly selected, but, but my role is to do the best I can so that I can almost be the top of the class, then there is an incentive for you to actually work hard. So the choice of words here is really interesting. So by Guru saying that the divine is choosing based on who it's pleased by, there's an incentive for you to do some effort. So like we said, it's like a, a student trying to please a, um, a teacher, but there are other ways that we can look at this. Think of a lover trying to please their beloved. You know, when you start a new relationship, you wanna do everything to please that person. Now, we could also say that whether your beloved is going to be pleased by you or not is quite random, but that's quite disheartening. You like the idea of trying to entice your new love, your new bride, your new lover in your life. So you do as much as you can to try and please them. Or think about a servant trying to please their master. The master has lots of different servants, but the one servant is trying really hard to get that master's attention. So this is the kind of words that Guruji is using. It is meant to be an encouragement for us to actually try to do the effort that we need to do so that our mind doesn't think, oh, well, I can just sit back and do nothing. The mind has to think, actually, no, I, I have to be the top of the class. I really have to try my best to please my master. So Guruji even answers the question, which are the servants that are pleasing to the master? Jotut Bhavan. Rate tere pagat rasale. So the meditators who are absorbed in your worship, they're the ones who get the fruits of the labor. The ones who are absorbed, the pagats who are rasale, rasvale, they're just completely so drenched in love, so drenched in prem pagti. They're the ones who are pleasing. They're the ones who see the benefits of their med meditation. So the ones who are doing it out of absolute love for their divine. So meditation is no longer an ego boost. It's not about being chosen and being the best one. It's about being the one that is just completely so in love with meditation, so in love with prem and bhakti and singing the praises of, of the divine, singing those, constantly remembering those songs of, of love, constantly singing the praises of the divine. Those are the meditators who are the most pleasing. And ultimately, Guruji is saying that that is the characteristic that we need to adopt if we have this desire within our mind that we need to find this one divine God, we need to please this, this being, that we need to actually get the fruit of all of the effort. Guru tells you exactly how to do that. Don't do it out of ego. 
do it out of love. Do it that the meditation is something that's so pleasing to you that the divine will see how pleased you are. Imagine the servant who is so much enjoying just being a servant. The one that is just loves their duty, loves their role. How happy is that going to make the one who's being served? That master is just going to look at that servant and the master falls in love with the servant and says, wow, the very way in which you serve is so beautiful. Just from the smallest gesture, think about a servant just giving a, making a cup of tea for their master. How would they prepare that cup? How would they take that cup to their master? How would they serve that cup? Just the very way in which you serve your master should be so full of love that the one looking at, at your service just melts. That the very master falls at the feet of the servant and says, wow, the way that you serve is so inspirational. I want to be like you. And so Guruji is using this analogy that we have to learn how to serve this master. Ratte tere pagatra sale. The pagats who are just so immersed in your love. And then Guru says, Hor kete gavan se me chitna avan. There are so many more who are singing your, pra- your praises. Hor kete gavan. How many more are singing your praises? Se me chitna avan. I can't recall them. I can't count them. They're beyond my thinking and my awareness. Nanak kya vichare. What can poor Nanak do? What can vichara Nanak do? What can that garib, poor, humble Nanak do? Or vichare could be, what vichar can I say? What can I describe? How can poor Nanak describe this? There's no limit to your praise. How can I give a number to the number of people people that are praising you. Guru already said, Antana Sifti, na ant. there's no limit to your praises. So I can't count all of them. I can't recall all of them. What can Garib Nanak, poor Nanak do? Soi, soi, sada, sach, sahib, sacha, sachi, nai. An interesting thing to note about this line is where people put the bisram. The word bisram means pause. When you read Gurbani, generally most lines in Guru Granth Sahib Ji have one pause. And a lot of the Japji Sahib that we've read so far, and even the previous lines, Hor kete gavan se me chitna avan, pause, nanak kya vichare. So there's a very definite pause in most lines in Guru Granth Sahib Ji. But sometimes you come across lines in Guru Granth Sahib Ji that has two pauses. And we understand that by looking at the words itself. Some people incorrectly say this line as soi soi sada sach sahib sacha sachi nai. So they put one pause in there. But when we start looking at the words, we realize that those words don't fit together in that way. If we were to say soi soi sada sach sahib, put a pause there, then the word nae can't have sacha and sachi attached to it. The word nae means greatness. So sahib is masculine. We can say sacha sahib. And we can say sachi nae. Nae here means greatness, which is a feminine word. So you can't say sacha sachi nae because the word sach sacha is determined by which word it's attached to. It's either attached to a masculine word and then it's sacha, or it's attached to a feminine word and it's sachi. You can't have a phrase that says sacha sachi. That's like saying tera teri nam. It doesn't make any sense. It, the word tera or teri depends on which word it's attached to. So the word nam would be masculine. It would always be tera nam or mera nam. So you can't say words like sacha sachi nai. But if we put two pauses in there, it makes perfect sense. Soi, soi, sada, sach, pause. Sahib, sacha, and that works really well because sahib is masculine and sacha is masculine. And sachi, nai. So the word nai, which means greatness, is a feminine word. So sachi, nai. So that's how you pronounce this. And we've seen examples of this being used in Japji Sahib already. In Pauri 21, Guruji says, Vada sahib, vadi nai. 
Gita Jaka Hove. So grand is that master and grand is its praise. Here the word nai means praise or your greatness. Vada Sahib Vadi Nai. So in the same way we can say Sahib Sacha Sachi Nai. So Soi Soi Sada Sach. This and only this is forever permanent. Soi Soi this only this Sada Sach is forever permanent. Remember, remember the word Sach always means permanent. It doesn't mean truth. Where we say Ad Sach Jugad Sach the word such means something that is permanently true. So the word such more accurately translates to permanent than it does to the word truth. So what we're saying is this master is always going to be true. Regardless of all of the creation that we've just talked about, if this creation wasn't here, the master that we're all singing the praises to, that's always going to be here. Sui sui sada such, Saheb sacha. The permanent master, Sachi Nyai, permanently great. Habhi Hosi Jai Najasi Rachana Jin Rachai. Habhi Hosi Jai Najasi Rachana Jin Rachai. Now, this is bringing in words that we've seen right at the beginning near the Mool Mantar. Habhi Sach Nanak Hosi Bi Sach. So Guru is using the same words that ultimately the Japji Sahib is a description of that Mool Mantar. So maybe right at the beginning when we looked at that, we wouldn't have understood what Ad such, Jugad such, Habi such, Nanak Hosi be such, which is why the whole of the Japji Sahib exists. It's a continuation of that conversation that Guru starts with the Mool Mantar and it continues to explain further that we're still talking about the same thing. It is now, Habi, Hosi, it forever will be. Jai Najasi. Jai means to be born. Jaman. It is Jai Na. It is never born and Na Jasi. So the word Na here is an example of this word that we've come across here before, which is this Dehuri Deepki, which is a word which is in the middle of two different words and the word in the middle applies to the one at the beginning and the one at the end. So, Jai Na Na Jasi, that's how you have to interpret it. Habi Hosi, it is now, it forever will be. Jai Na Jasi, born not and does not go. It does not come and it does not go. Rachna Jin Rachai, so present now, always will be never born nor dies, is that who created the creation, Rachana Jin Rachai, that one that created the creation. So Guru is clarifying again concepts that we've seen right in, in the beginning of the Mool Mantar, which is about Akal, Murat and Ajuni, the one that was never born and never dies. So Guru has mentioned time here, Habi Hosi, present and future. So what Guru is talking about is that there is this oneness that is beyond time. It's beyond the three states of time. It isn't limited to past, present and future. This thing that we're talking about is beyond time. In fact, it's the creator of time itself. It is the creator of all, the sustainer of all. It's that permanent one. There is no equivalent Devi Devta that is worth even thinking about in parallel to this oneness. All these Devi, Devte, everything is singing the praises of that final great one. There's no God or Goddess that is worthy of, of praise because they're all praising that oneness. So all the above mentioned creations, you create them, you destroy them. But we don't look at the, that which is created or destroyed, we look at the creative power that creative force that's behind everything. Habi hosi jai na jasi rachna jin rachai rangi rangi pati kar kar jinsi maya jin upai So again, some people put the bisaram after the word jinsi rangi rangi pati kar kar jinsi maya jin upai But Professor Saib Singh suggests that the 
Bisram, the pause, appears at the end of Rangi, Rangi, Pati, Kar, Kar, Jin, Si, Maya, Jin, Upai. So Rangi, Rangi, all these different colors. Pati means all these different shapes, Kar, Kar, that you've created. Think about now all the description that, that Guru Nanak Dev Ji has given. Think about the entire world. Guru says that anything that has ever been created in those four sources of creation, all of the things in lots of different colors, in lots of different shapes and sizes. Jinsi, the word Jinsi means species. In, in fact, it's related to the English word genus, which is a categorization of, of, of different uh, species and genes and, and, and things like that. The word genus originates here from this word Jinsi. So, Rangi, Rangi, Pati, Kar, Kar, Jinsi, the different species that you've created, the Maya that you've created, this material illusion that you've created, Jin Upai, the one that's created all of this. You who created the many colors, the many shapes and types, the creatures of many different species, and the illusionary matter, all of Maya, all of this illusion, all of the physical world, the physical matter that you have created, you're the creative force behind all of them. You are the one that's behind all of these creations of different colors and sizes. And then what did you do once you created them? And what are you doing at every moment that you created them? Kar kar vekhe kita apna by doing so, by creating all of these things, this oneness sits and observes all of them. It watches everything. It observes what it has done. Kar kar vekhe kita apna. It sits back and it watches all that it has created. That which is kita apna, its own creation, it watches it. Jivtis divadiyai, according to its own will. According to its own vadiyai, it looks and it, and it observes its own greatness. It observes what it has created. So your creation is so great that nobody can understand how you've created it. Even today, nobody knows how, how matter is created. Nobody knows how this universe has, cre has been created. There are ideas and there are theories, but nobody knows. Look at the whole universe. Where did it come from? How did it just spring out of nowhere? Guru saying that look at this great power that has created this whole universe. Nothing appears just by itself. There is this creativity that's there. There is some power that's created the universe. Whether you like to call it a god or not really doesn't matter. Everyone can appreciate that there's something that created this whole universe. What is that something? This is that something that Guru is talking about. And this something that creates everything it's there now. It's not something that's created it and gone away. It's actually sitting and observing everything. It's infused into everything. And this is where we can start looking at old, ancient spiritual traditions and very New Age traditions. Because the, the New Age traditions all talk about the observer. It talks about consciousness. It talks about the witness, the one that observes everything. Here we can look at Gurbani that actually gives the same description that the, this creative power that created everything, it's sitting there and it's watching all of its createness. It's, it's watching all of its creativity. It's watching its own greatness. It knows when it creates something. It knows when it destroys something. It's the only thing that actually knows anything about creation. And another way to look at this word veke is that not only are you observing your whole creation, but you're watching over it. So another way that people translate this is that you create everything and then you vikhe, you watch over it, you look after everything. So what is keeping us alive right now? Who knows? Just think about it. You're alive right now. What's making you alive? The scientist could say, oh, it's your heart beating. But that's just a pump. That's just a mechanism. What's keeping that heart pumping? What's sending those electric signals to the heart? What's keeping your brain buzzing and vibrant and alive and alert, awake? 
within you right now there's this energy of aliveness that we have no idea what it is and it's there and it's in everything all around us so you are this it's talking to something very close very personal to you it's not you in your great mansion in the sky this is why Guru said where are you where's your door and then Guru says actually I can see your door everywhere because in the very aliveness of all of creation, in everything that's being created, think about the tiniest worms and maggots and insects and then just living their own lives and, and being created and being destroyed. Guru says, I can see, I can see that they're all singing your praises because they're all a song of life. They're all just life singing its song. This is the gave, garvan that Guru keeps talking about. Life is just buzzing and singing all around us and it's happening to us as we speak. But because we're so lost in the mind, because we spend all of our life just trying to collect things and look after our own little surroundings, that we forget that we're alive. And the very fact that you're alive means that there's something right here with you and that's worthy of praise. Just for a moment, regardless of whether you see yourself as religious or not, belonging to any religion or, or being completely agnostic or, or atheist, you can all appreciate that you're alive and everything alive around you is just buzzing, is vibrating, is bursting with aliveness. What is that aliveness? Guru Nanak says that aliveness is worthy of our time, worthy of our attention and worthy of our praise because without it, you wouldn't exist. Nothing would exist. So, Guru says that this aliveness is everywhere. It's conscious, it's awake, it's looking after everything, it's keeping us alive. Jyotis pave soi karsi hukam na karna jai. Whatever is pleasing to you, Jyotis pave, whatever pleases this aliveness, soi karsi, that's what it does. It just does what it does. Hukam na karna jai. And we cannot command it. There's nothing that we can say to life. There's nothing, no command that we can give to the oneness. Gurbani actually says, Nanak hukam na chale nal khasam chale ardas. That there is no command that you can give to this thing. If you want something, the only thing that you can do is you can ask. You can do an ardas, but you can't command over it. That just goes to show what are we doing? Are we having any expectations, even in our ardas? Do we have any sort of expectations that says, you know what, I've done this much now, I've done a hundred akhand parts, I've done a million chope sabs, I've done a hundred thousand akhand parts and I've done so many ardas, by now you should have listened to me. If there's any part of you that thinks that you have a say in what the universe has to do, that you can somehow control it, even by doing lots and lots of asking, that's not really an ardas then. It's not an ardas if you have an expectation at the end of it. If you think, come on, now's enough's enough, you really should listen to me by now. Nanak hukam na chale. There is no hukam that, will, that this king is going to listen to. This king is not going to listen to its own child that it's created. The very thing that it is inside, it is, it is part of you. What are you going to ask life of? Just be thankful that life exists. And just be thankful that you have the ability to know that it exists. You are conscious of life itself. That's not a small thing. You have a guru to thank just for being conscious that you know that life exists. So, hukam na karana jai. There is nothing that you can say to give command over this. He is the commander. This is the commander. Hukumi hovanakar hukam na kahiya jai. It is by its hukam, it is by its divine will that it has created creation. So there's no hukam that you can say. There's nothing that you can say that's going to change its mind. And so Guruji brings back this idea of hukam. Notice how everything that we've talked about fits really nicely with the very beginning verses of Japji Sahib. The Mool Mantar, the opening Salok, the first verse, Nanak hukam na chale, nal khasam chale ardas. Guruji right at the beginning says it's all about hukam. So here after singing the praises of everything, 
After saying, look at all these amazing things that are singing your praises, Guruji always ends on hukam, that it comes down to hukam. This thing is in control. You either like it or you struggle. You either go with the flow or you're going to find it really difficult in life. Guruji has talked about this even in, in a couple of verses ago in Body 25. Guruji says, Band khala se paane hoye. Your liberation is reliant on you understanding pana. You have to understand pana. You have to understand hukam. You have to go with hukam. Liberation, band kalasi. Kalasi means liberation from your band, from your bondage. Liberation from your bondage is happening only when you are liberated enough to know what hukam is. You have to go in line with hukam. And that means that you give up your liberation. Your mukti, you give it up because you can't have any expectation of liberation. This is why in Sikhi we don't talk about enlightenment. We're not interested in enlightenment. We're interested in just accepting the hukam. If the hukam says I'm going to be enlightened, that's up to the hukam. If the hukam says I'm not going to be enlightened, that's also up to hukam. What can you do? There's nothing you can do to become enlightened. Stop trying. Guru doesn't want you to focus on enlightenment. Guru doesn't want you to focus on spiritual powers. Guru wants you to focus on the very system of the universe. If you just go with the flow, just completely surrender yourself to how the universe is, then you'll start looking at trying to find enlightenment. But not because you want enlightenment, but purely because your way of serving this divine is to say, I'm going to serve you by just accepting your hukum. Nobody can tell you any other way of enlightenment but just to go along with hukam. And so Guruji ends the final line, So path shah sah path sahib nanak rahan rajai. So path shah, this is the king. Shah path sahib. Of all the shah, of all the kings, this is the path sahib, the supreme king. There's no other king that we need to bow down to. This is the ultimate king. This is the king of kings. Nanak rehen rajai. Nanak says, remain within its will. Go within its will. Its, its rajai is, is what's important. It's the way it is, the way it, it, it exists, go, go with that. So the verse opens by asking this question, where is your door? What is your house like? What is your mansion like? What would it be like to be in your presence? So, However we translate that, that word, where is your door, how is your door, either way it's asking for clarification. What is it like to be in your presence? What is your door? How do I recognize you? And even though the rest of the verse talks about all of the different forms that are singing your praises, we have to relate that to ourselves. We always have to come back to our lives and say, how does that relate to us? Our life is a song. Our life is a divine song. And maybe we can start seeing our life in that way. If the great warriors, just by being warriors, are a praise to the divine, if the great meditators, just by meditating, are a praise to the divine, if all of creation, just by being alive, is a praise to the divine, then maybe we need to see our life in that way. Our very way of living is the way that the divine has created us. The very way that we've been created is part of that life song. So maybe we should start seeing the very simple things that we do. Going to work, that's your song. It's your hukam. Going shopping, eating, parenting, looking after your family, going out with friends, being entertained. All of that stuff is just part of your, your song. This is the song that you've created. So we don't need to look very far to find this God. We don't have to travel somewhere to find God. Guru says the very way that you're living right now is God's praise. But only few of them are aware of this. Only the ones that are pleasing to you, who have served this wisdom, have actually realized that this is what's going on. The whole of the universe is just your song. So everything that is happening is part of the divine hukam, that divine command. And when we recognize the hukam of everything, that's when we begin to enter the door of God. That's when we know how to open the door. So I think we'll leave it there for today. Wai Guruji ka khalsa, Wai Guruji ki fateh.